the discussion. And now we're recording, so here we go. Right. Sorry about that. Um, you're that. also welcome to sure. You're also welcome to type your questions in the chat area of the Zoom, uh, and we'll we'll look at those. And Dr. Hill will kindly help me with those as well if I miss them. Yes, <clears throat> I just uh, volunteered you, Dr. Hill. All right. Anyway, this is here. Now we get to the good stuff. Our first speaker is Monet Harbison, who is a PhD student in the School of Education. Monet is a dedicated second year part time PhD student at Drexel University School of Education, committed to advancing equity and inclusivity in education. Born and raised in Philadelphia, Monet has deep rooted connections to the bottom community where her family has lived for generations and where Drexel University currently resides. Monet's research focuses on utilizing innovative narrative inquiry methods to examine the intersections of power, privilege, and historical legacies within the educational landscape. Her passion for fostering a more inclusive and just educational environment shapes her academic pursuits. In addition to her studies, Monet serves as the Associate Director of Privacy Program Services at Drexel University, where she continues to challenge and dismantle oppressive structures in education. Through her work, Monet aspires to create a fair and equitable system that benefits all learners. Today, Monet will be speaking about enhancing educational narratives, the power of testimonial and music elicitation. So, Monet, welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and I also want to wish everyone who celebrates uh, um, happy Ramadan, happy Passover, um, happy Easter, or if you do not celebrate any of those things, just a happy day. Um, I also recognize that my um, presentation might not be accessible to everyone. So inside the chat, I am sharing an accessibility document um, for folks to follow along should they need to. All right, and with that, I'll get started. So my presentation is called Enhancing Educational Narratives, Examining the Potential of Testimonial um, in Music Elicitation in Research. So just an overview of what we're going to go over today. Of course, we're going to do an introduction. I'm going to talk about narrative research, um, some limitations of narrative research, my positionality, um, testimonial in education research, musical elicitation in education research, a case study based on these methods. Um, I'm also going to talk about the benefits of using musical elicitation and testimonial in education research, some recommendations, and the conclusion. So this presentation really talks about the potential of testimonial and musical elicitation and how it can strengthen narrative research um, and uh, reveal diverse viewpoints, how it can foster reflexivity within the researcher. And uh, specifically, I want to show through this presentation that testimonial and musical uh, elicitation can unveil diverse um, perspectives and experiences, um, deepen how the researcher comprehends the participant's narrative, uh, cultivate a better researcher uh, flexibility, um, and promote inclusive and transformative um, practices. Author's note, as I put into the chat, um, is an accessibility document for you to follow along. So what is narrative research? So narrative research is a qualitative method, and it's used to uncover the insights of people's stories. And we do that by analyzing the narratives. Um, researchers try to identify themes and patterns that talk, that kind of reveal what the participants' uh, perspectives are. And so this approach is really uh, values of subjective um, experiences and more complex. Recently, we'll, we're seeing narrative research really evolve. So we're seeing more participatory research and narrative research, and even using different methodologies that were formerly mostly used in the health sciences fields. So what are some of the challenges of narrative research? Uh, these are some of the challenges that I came across as I was examining narrative research. So there can be selective bias, uh, whenever a researcher is interacting with a research participant, there can be a power imbalance. Um, as a researcher, if you are dealing with a community that is not your own, it can result in different stereotypes and assumptions. Um, and if you're dealing with different socioeconomic groups, different cultural groups, it can also lead to a lot of assumptions and linguistic barriers. Um, there are some consequences of compromised validity and ethics. 
uh, we can inadvertently silence the voices of disenfranchised groups. Um, and we can overlook the power imbalances, especially if our motives are good, right? We want to tell the stories of the folks that we're um, working with, but if we, if there's a power imbalance and they see us as an authority figure, how can we do that? So um, there are some key challenges. Uh, subjective analysis is influenced by the researcher's biases. Uh, it, you can have difficulty understanding what the experiences of systemically excluded communities are um, because there aren't a monolith and some things are beyond words. So why did I want to explore different methods? So I think that that really goes back into my positionality. I have a strong desire to amplify systemically excluded voices in education. Um, I was drawn to narrative inquiry because I want to hear the stories. I want to hear what people are saying, feeling, thinking, how they go about the uh, world, but I wanted to have a deeper understanding. Like I said previously, sometimes the words that we say don't tell the full story of what we mean. Um, I like to emphasize decolonial methods and I want to decenter Western focused approaches. Um, I am a post-structuralist. So I understand that there are intersecting power dynamics and I want to kind of challenge how knowledge is acquired and how it's disseminated. Uh, as a researcher, I focus on hip hop and R&B in my music elicitation because it has emotional resonance and cultural significance for me. Um, and those are the groups that I want to connect with. And I want to kind of enhance an authentic storytelling experience. Testimonial and education research. So testimonial is a Latin American research method um, that focuses on the personal narratives of marginalized individuals um, to challenge social injustice. Some examples of this um, are rooted in works like Rigoberta Minchu's I Rigoberto Minchu. Um, testimonial is meant to empower the participants by centering their voices and they become co-authors um, along with the researcher in finding this testimonial. If you grew up in the Black church, um, like I did, a testimonial, a testimony. So when you say your testimony, you are talking about the trials and tribulations that you experienced. You're talking about your journey through healing um, and eventually getting to the end. It's a very powerful experience in the Black church. And I believe that testimonial also fulfills that. And I think that that fulfills that for me and other people who are similarly, similarly positioned. Uh, this table represents the key principles of testimonial and educational research and some of their benefits. Um, for example, it promotes social justice, so it can address some of the systemic issues and promote change. It emphasizes collaboration between the researcher and the participant. Um, it focuses on uh, collective experiences too. So the testimony can be a testimony of the community, it can be a testimony of the self, but that really ultimately builds the community. Um, and I think that that's really important for the work that I'm trying to do. Um, similarly, music elicitation is a qualitative research method that uses music uh, to catalyze the storytelling. And it asks um, the participant to engage with the music to elicit an emotional response or memory. Um, music transcends language. Music goes across um, different groups, different communities. We have different types of music that we value. Um, and in the, I think, 50 years of hip hop, we're seeing that hip hop is a global phenomenon now, right? So the, that's another example of how music can um, transcend language barriers. Um, and these are some of the key principles of music elicitation uh, in this table. And the table also describes the benefits. So, for example, um, I spoke a little bit about transcending uh, language barriers. So it allows uh, for diverse uh, perspectives, regardless of language proficiency. How I talk about a song is not how you will talk about a song. How I understand the song is not how you will understand a song, but that doesn't really matter um, with music elicitation because we value the voices of anyone who's involved. 
So for using music elicitation and testimonial, um, this case study was based on a research study that I did. I had two participants, Dominique and Makiba, and I asked them to bring three songs that represented their identity as academics, their connection to their community and their future aspirations. So who are they? What does it mean to be a black woman academic, um, especially at a predominantly white in, uh, institution? So for the procedure, they shared the songs that they selected um, as they were discussing their academic and personal experiences. They used the songs and the song lyrics as a framework for building their testimony, their testimonial. Um, and I facilitated the conversation. So I would ask deeper questions um, to have participants reflect on their experiences um, and make sense of them in the relation to the songs. So some of the key findings um, that I found from doing these methods within my research, they it did not enabled the participants to engage with their academic journey in a deeper, more personal level. Um, so we had gone beyond um, researcher and participant. We kind of were on equal playing fields. Um, it also allowed me to go on a deeper level of understanding what they were saying. Um, music elicitation and testimonial really came together um, and allowed Dominique and Makiba to really articulate the connection between their identities, their communities, and their aspirations in a way that I couldn't have even imagined. Uh, it was very um, powerful for me. And the combination of these methods helped the participants um, challenge the traditional power dynamics in academia. It helped them to, and it helped me to understand how they, through their actions, are challenging traditional power dynamics in academia. So I wanted to give this graphic, and this is a Venn diagram that shows what are the key things for testimonial, what are the key principles for music elicitation, and how they kind of synergize to work together. Um, and as you can see in the middle Venn diagram where it overlaps, you'll see that they both focus on empowering participants it allows them to access emotions and memories. It enhanced um, um, inclusivity and cultural sensitivity. It encouraged me to be very reflexive um, and it helped me to build a rapport. So uh, as I was working through the songs that they gave me, as I was working through the um, songs and the lyrics and I was going through the transcripts and I was reading the transcripts alongside of coding it, it became less of a job. It became an experience and it became very emotional and it, um, kind of spiritual because I felt like I understood uh, my participants on a deeper level um, because I also, so I was coding in levels, right? I was coding their transcript. I was coding the song. I was reflecting on my um, testimony of being a black woman academic and all of that kind of synergized to kind of build this reflexivity of what this means and going back and checking again and asking myself those questions. So I have recommendations for anyone who is interested in using these um, in their methods. Uh, I would utilize testimonial music elicitation together, um, but that's not, there are other methods that I think are also powerful that you can combine, but kind of focus um, uh, on using those to enhance the narratives and the diverse perspectives and try to understand them on a deep, deeper level. Um, to address challenges, be mindful of your subjectivity. What is your positionality? What is your paradigm? What brought you here today to do this research um, and recognize and address your biases? So as you're coding, a lot of the times when I was coding, if there was something that I had um, an overt reaction to, rather than just code it, um, I made a note of it kind of on the side. Uh, like, why is that? So that I can go back and read it later. So I think that, and I hope that this presentation kind of highlighted the benefits of using testimonial and music elicitation and how it can empower participants and foster inclusivity, how it can challenge traditional power dynamics. Um, for my next steps, I'm hoping to use this um, in my dissertation work. Um, lessons learned for me in using this. I wasn't prepared for the emotional impact 
of working with testimonial um, and how that would make me feel, but through the coding. Um, and I'll share that with the supplementary materials um, after this. I had songs that spoke to me about the experience of listening to what their testimonials were, to listening to the music that they brought um, along with coding it. And so I also had to focus on that um, and kind of bring that all together to tell this full story of what it meant to not only get their testimonies, but try to make sense of their testimonies as a researcher. So you can use this QR code to see um, my references and supplementary materials. I'll also put the link in the chat, uh, but there is a playlist that goes along with the music that we um, got together from the participants and the music from me that kind of synergized to talk about this entire experience. Thank you. Thank you, Monet. Mm -hmm. So any questions for Monet? I have a question. Um, yeah. I was wondering, you talked a little bit about the emotional impact that this had on you. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on that. Sure. So I had two participants, um, both Black women, and they have very different stories uh, about what they um, what they were experiencing, what they were going through, what they needed. And as I was coding the songs, as I was coding their transcripts, I was listening to the music alongside of it. And at certain points, um, as they were kind of telling me about their experiences through the transcript and I'm listening to the song, it was very emotional for me. Um, and I had to kind of go back and think about what does that story mean? And how does that make sense? What does that mean for me as an academic? How did I make sense of that as an academic? How did I make sense of that as a Black woman? Um, what does that mean to be um, stateless in a place where you don't always feel like you belong? Um, how do you find healing in that? And so uh, within that experience, I had an emotional kind of as I said, testimonial testimony um, that came from just coding and talking about what it was that they were telling me, that they, the words that they entrusted me with. Thank you, Monet. Other, other questions? I have a question. Um, yeah. I've been, um, and Monet and I know each other, so I've been asking her about testimonial a lot, and I didn't really I feel like I wasn't understanding it until I saw you lay it out. Are there other elicitation methods that are common for testimonial? Um, there are several different elicitation methods. Some use photo elicitation um, as a method to kind of like pull in the stories of what happened. Um, one, one that I have found recently was like literal, um, literary um, elicitation. So, books and stories that kind of like made them um, what they were. And so looking at these different elicitation methods to kind of enhance it, because the lyrics mean something different to me than it necessarily did to my participants. So I, but I also had to code the lyrics and sometimes, um, so I would choose an elicitation method if I was going to use testimonial um, that kind of talks about the complexity and the nuance so that you can talk about that in your work. So why was it complex to code this particular part of the transcript? Why was it complex to um, code this song? What, what, how did the researcher have to be reflexive? So I think that there are so many different elicitation methods that can be used, but I would um, encourage you to focus on elicitation methods that um, speak to you. No, that's really helpful, Monet. Um, and I can definitely see how it would enrich it because I was like desperately trying to understand the difference between testimonial and other forms of narrative inquiry. And it seems like it's a more fluid approach, but then I, I got it. It clicked for me. Thank you. No, thanks. And other questions? I have one as well. 
Um, hi, Monet. Um, so I uh, was. I think this was a, a great presentation, and I'm I'm wondering, um, do you have any other ideas for using it in the future? Or um, I, I just I, it's funny. I was just talking to my students yesterday about how music just transcends all differences between us, and so I do see the power um, behind it. So I'm just curious about what your your future aspirations are with these two uh, dynamic research methods? So I think that these research methods really work well to talk about the global majority um, and the experiences of the global majority. And so I hope to take these methods um, and kind of try to tell the story of what it means to be um, black or brown or oppressed within education systems on a global level. Um, I'm thinking um, in particular of the global Aboriginal community, um, you know, the Ainu, um, the Maori, the um, Native Hawaiians, the um, Indigenous people of the United States, um, the Indigenous communities in uh, Latin America. They're all having separate experiences within education um, that aren't being told because all of our policies, procedures, theory is focused in the majority narrative. Wonderful. Uh, other questions for Monet? Monet, I had a quick one. Um, you, and you said something that connected it to, to the question I was going to ask. I'm very passionate about film, used to teach film. So I'm, I'm thinking um, having people bring scenes from film as a as a means of elicitation for a particular whatever you're thinking about which, or part of their testimonial. Have you heard, have you seen that before or have you thought through that at all? So they do video elicitation, but recently um, the only video elicitations that I saw, um, there weren't a lot for testimonial because um, testimonial is generally centered in the Latinx community. Um, so there hasn't been um, a diverse set of ways, but they did have students, and it's used as a um, pedagogical tool, um, but the students were bringing in videos, but mostly they were videos from music videos um, or something of the like. I think that film elicitation can also be very powerful. Um, also thinking about the ways in which like um, popular culture kind of built me would be a powerful way to kind of like, you know, in this scene, <laughs> like this spoke to me because, and then having to code that scene and kind of deal with the nuance. No, that's, that, that's interesting. Well, Monet, thank you for a wonderful presentation uh, and your time in answering questions. Thank, so, you, thank you. All right, so we'll move on to our second presenter, uh, Robert Van Vorst, who is an EDD student in the School of Education. Robert, Van, Robert received his EDD in Educational Leadership and Management from Drexel University. He is currently an elementary school administrator with a wide range of experience implementing uh, SEL programming on both the school level and district level. He was a contributor to the book, Rethinking Disability, a Disability Studies Approach to Inclusive Practices. <clears throat> Today, Robert will be speaking about social emotional learning and school climate, a case study of elementary teachers. So Robert, welcome and uh, looking forward to hearing you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to be here. Um, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I'm currently a school administrator and elementary building. Um, and my background as an administrator really drove my research um, looking at social emotional learning and school climate. Um, so the title, the title of my research, which uh, I just wrapped up at the end of uh, this past summer, was titled Social Emotional Learning and School Climate, a Case Study of Elementary Teachers. Traditionally, when we look at, at schools, um, you know, schools are looked at as you know, wanting to support the academic um, needs of students and, and the social needs of students. And that was that primary role of schools over the years. But this responsibility really has evolved into a multifaceted approach to look at the whole child and really understand how both the social and emotional needs of kids really impact their learning. So looking at the problem, SEL and school climate, over the years, they both developed their own set 
of uh, research and really defined benefits. So they've kind of gone alongside of each other for years with this established you know, group of research and, and benefits that have been noted by, by school leaders and uh, educational leaders across the country. The problem though, and especially for me, what really got me interested in looking at this side of, of SEL and school climate is that the problem is that the research really connecting the two between SEL and how specifically SEL implementation um, really impacts school climate is just not out there that much. Uh, it's touched on, but that direct relationship to when SEL is, is implemented in schools and that direct impact that it has on school climate, it's just not that robust right now. So really, um, you know, educational leaders, especially in elementary buildings, really are limited to really justify attention at times to, to both areas, both, you know, SEL and school climate, when in reality, they might be working alongside of each other more than we realize. So that's what really drove my research. And I thought it was necessary really to look into it. Um, so then other educational leaders and teachers could take a look at, you know, their school improvement plans and their efforts. And really by, you know, taking a look at SEL, are they really doing more than they realize? So the purpose of this research was to help educational leaders better understand the impact of SEL programming on the school climate of elementary schools. This area of research, kind of building off what I said before, is, is pretty significant because educational leaders really are, they need to consider really the use, the use of their resources. How do they best influence change? Uh, how do they give assurance to all the stakeholders that they're accountable to about the steps that they're taking in their schools and their districts? So on this slide, you can see the different stakeholders. Um, you know, you, we have students, we have our teachers, we have our staff, we have our community as a whole and other stakeholders like board members. Um, so leaders really, um, this problem and, and looking into SEL's impact in schools and specifically on school climate um, really helps justify the use of these resources and these approaches to all of these different groups of stakeholders. It's also significant because the current research surrounding SEL and school climate really shows that symbiotic relationship where each framework is really drawing those benefits from each other, like I noted before, um, but they're working alongside of each other. So really, what is that link between the two of them? Um, and really, how does it help us recognize how teachers and students experience school life when SEL programming is in place. So really illuminating the link between SEL and school climate will really, you know, I was hoping to provide that clarity um, that's needed to, to understand that interdependence between these two constructs. The research questions that I developed and really focused on were, um, how does the instruction of social emotional learning impact school climate? With two, and I also had two sub questions. How do teachers perceive the relationship of social and emotional learning to the quality and character of school life? And also, how do teachers explain the value of SEL? So, the setting for my research was a kindergarten through sixth grade elementary school here in South Central Pennsylvania. Uh, the school itself has over 500 students. Um, I was really lucky enough to have a lot of participants. I had 11 overall. Um, I was able to hold seven one-on-one -on -one interviews um, with teachers from kindergarten through sixth grade. So I was able to get uh, a teacher representative from each grade level, which was really, really good. Um, I also held a focus group um, and had representation uh, from first grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. One other interesting thing I had available to me were some artifacts. Uh, the school itself has collected school climate data since back in 2016. So um, having that historical data up until 2022 was very helpful. Uh, the school itself was also collecting school-wide SEL data 
from back uh, from 2020 on to 2022. So some interesting artifacts uh, were able to be collected in addition to the interviews and the focus group. The big themes that popped up um, from those one-on-one -on -one interviews and the focus group, uh, there were four big ones. The first one um, is about implementation. Implementation drives teacher investment in SEL programming. The second one, SEL evolves within its context. The third one, school climate is shaped by internal and external factors. And the fourth one, school climate is impacted and influenced by SEL. Now, my next slide, I wanted to just kind of show you some of the sub themes that came up um, because they were really interesting ones. So with the first theme, um, the sub themes you see uh, the first sub theme of implementation drives teacher investment in SEL programming um, had very interesting sub themes. This is where teachers talked about how moving to SEL really is a transition. Um, it was a change for them. Uh, while they recognized that SEL isn't something new, it was still a bigger transition than they realized. They also talked about intentional approaches that were used and they talked about training and how important that was. Uh, they, they talked about a ground up approach that was slow and steady and not just like rushed. Uh, they talked about different structures in the school that were used to drive SEL, and then also additional resources that came over time. Uh, and they also talked about administrative support. When we look at the second theme, SEL evolves within its context. This is where teachers talked about embedding SEL during the school day. So it's not just like a standalone lesson, it's, it's really built in across the school day in different ways. Um, SEL instruction is based on students' needs. So even though there are certain resources, teachers were able to do more um, and really tailor things to the students in their classrooms. Um, they noticed that you know stu the student application of social emotional learning they talked about, they, they observed their students using the skills that they were teaching them in the classroom. They saw them using those skills outside of their classroom. And then they also talked about how the importance of uh, teacher's perception of SEL and how it influences its role in the school. The third theme talking about school climate is influenced by SEL. One of the biggest things that came up um, really across all participants in this study was they talked about interactions. They talked about student to student interactions uh, in the classroom, outside the classroom. And they also talked about teacher to student interactions and how those changed over time in many good ways. Uh, they also talked about increased student ownership. So students really taking ownership of um, how they do things like morning meetings, what they do during quiet time, how they use the different skills for themselves and take ownership of it. And finally, the fourth theme, school climate is shaped by internal and external factors. Teachers talked about those internal factors, like their relationships with other teachers, uh, having psychological safety, um, their perception of what a good school climate should be and what it is. Um, and they talked a lot about their own SEL, so their own social and emotional competence. They also brought up external factors. Um, they talked about you know, a student's experience outside of school. They talked about even the impact of community and government and uh, you know, funding and how that impacts school climate. So a lot of, a lot of interesting sub themes that really paint a picture of what these, you know, bigger themes were all about. I, I felt it was important to kind of, you know, bring some of these up because they were really, they really painted the picture of the teacher's experience in school and what they're seeing um, really kindergarten through sixth grade. Those artifacts I mentioned earlier, um, looking at the school climate data, uh, since 2016, the student perception of school climate increased from 2016 up until 2022. So uh, the school itself was actually below the Pennsylvania state average for school climate. And then it actually raised just above 
the state average. So it slowly increased to surpass the state average. With the SEL data that was collected from students over the past two years um, through surveys, um, primarily surveys and their self-perception surveys, um, students reported increased self-efficacy. And they also increased, the, in, uh, they also reported increased emotion regulation. So again, some really interesting takeaways, even from the artifacts to really go along with the words and perceptions of the participants um, in the one-on-one -on -one interviews and the focus group. So the, final, the results really led me to look at, you know, four main results. Um, the first one, a coherent implementation, uh, a coherent imp implementation approach establishes teacher ownership, understanding, and support for SEL. Next, uh, SEL, um, I'm sorry, allowing SEL to grow organically and based on student need maximizes its influence on student outcomes and really establishes it within the fabric of school life. The third result, SEL improves, improves school climate by promoting supportive interactions and student ownership within the school environment. And the last one, school leaders must consider all factors influence, influencing school climate and how these factors can change over time. When looking back at my research questions, I was able to really come down to some, I, I feel like some really strong conclusions that, that tie directly back to my questions. My, again, my first question was, how does the instruction of social emotional learning impact school climate? So SEL really helps teach those relationship skills that strengthen student to teacher, uh, student to student interactions, especially in the areas of social problem solving and also empathy. Those are two big areas that came up uh, from uh, the teacher participants. Overall, these improved social interactions result in a safer environment for students to develop their abilities to handle various social situations, consider the feelings of others, and improve academic, ac academic, academic interactions within their classroom. Also, a school-wide focus on SEL emphasizes the importance of teacher-student interactions and how it establishes optimal conditions for learning through those positive relationships with adults. And finally, as a program, SEL really helps school staff and faculty develop and utilize structures um, to really help SEL grow. Some of the big structures they talked about were morning meetings to start every day. Uh, they talked about quiet time after, um, after lunch. So kids have time to just calm down for the afternoon and kind of get ready for their afternoon. And they also talked about closing circle, which is a reflective time to, to really talk about their day. So these structures that they brought up really help um, develop, you know, promote that student ownership of the learning environment by the students. So with our next question, how do teachers perceive the relationship of social emotional learning to the quality and character of school life? So this study and the results, it really showed how when guided and prioritized, SEL can become really ingrained in the daily life of a school. And this really leads to a, a sense of defined autonomy for teachers to meet the social and emotional needs of their students. And, and this was really important because many Many of the participants talked about how every class each year is a little bit different. So they need that flexibility to, you know, have the resources to, to bring SEL and, and the structures, but they also need that, that autonomy to do what's right for their kids. Um, and really, to sustain SEL growth within the school, teachers must also feel connected to their school environment. They need to feel that safety. They need to have those strong professional relationships, and they need the opportunities to develop um, their own social and emotional development uh, from year to year. And finally, finally, my last sub question, how do teachers explain the value of SEL? Really capturing the lived experiences of the participants um, placed the significance of SEL alongside other really important aspects of school life. So 
things like academic progress, social relationships, emotional safety, um, and really students having a predictable school experience, all of those important aspects of school life, uh, participants put SEL right up there with it. Many of them said, you know, SEL is just as important as academic growth, if not more important. Um, they also, you know, SEL, when it, it can be held in high regard, but the implementation is so important. Um, the evolution of SEL was talked about by a lot of the, of the participants. And when they talked about it, they appreciated that the implementation of SEL was slow, steady, and ground up. Uh, it wasn't rushed. And that really increased the value that the teachers placed on SEL in the school. And finally, um, you know, this really helped weave SEL, uh, weaving SEL with academics. Um, uh, and, you know, it really helps teachers see it as an ongoing part of school life, really as opposed to a standalone program or a topic. So really integrating SEL into the school and really having it part of everything you do increases its value with teachers. So again, another big piece um, and conclusion that I was able to draw from, from the interviews and the focus group. Some recommendations I have um, based on my research. So the first one, when implementing SEL, start with a ground up implementation. I mentioned that a few times. Um, that really helps ingrain it in the school life and basically the culture of the school. It does take time. A lot of teachers recognize that, but again, the time is what gave it its value. So that's very important. The second one, focus on both the learning environment and the social emotional skill development of students when really developing and establishing the school-based SEL practices and programs. So what I mean by this is um, if we don't look at how kids are connecting with their classrooms and their school in general, they don't really have a meaningful place to practice those social and emotional skills. So they're not connecting with their teachers, with their classroom, with their school. Practicing these social emotional skills is not gonna mean as much to them and they're not gonna see the meaning behind it. The third recommendation, collect quantitative and qualitative data related to the social emotional growth of students. In this study, um, I was able to take the school's SEL data through student perception surveys. And I found it would be really interesting to sit down and also have student um, interviews, talk to students about their own social emotional growth in the school and put that alongside the quantitative data I was able to gather from those surveys. And a final recommendation, um, strengthen student ownership by utilizing qualitative SEL data um, and those collection met methods to authentically raise students' voice. So the student ownership piece was very big. Um, teachers talked about how you know, students are developed their own behavioral expectations for the schools. So really taking a look at you know, raising that student voice in a very intentional way um, to even build that ownership more and more for kids. Future research, so, so based on everything, I think it's important to really take a look at what are those SEL structures that have the greatest impact on the social and emotional development of students and program effectiveness. So the teachers here, I mentioned before how they talked about those different parts of their day, like morning meetings, like quiet times, like closing circles. Um, what, in addition to those, what other types of structures are out there that schools are finding um, really beneficial and helpful for their students? Another area of future research can really take a look at that potential tie between SEL and improved student self-efficacy. Um, those self-efficacy -effic scores across cohorts went up and up over two years, but it kind of made you think why. And is there a potential connection between SEL and student self-efficacy? If you could find that through research, I think that's gonna be a very powerful thing to potentially link if it's there. 
Also, how to authentically uh, promote adult SEL in systems. So uh, teachers talked about their own SEL, but many teachers also mentioned too how sometimes it seems like another thing to do. So how can that also be authentically promoted and integrated within what teachers do in a school day? And finally, uh, a final area of future research, understanding and developing school-wide SEL measurement tools in schools. Um, SEL measurement on a school-wide level is something that's still pretty new. Um, so how do we expand that? How do we get more tools to really look at the SEL development of our students? So I guess that's it in a nutshell. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you, Robert, for the presentation. Um, any questions for Robert? Well, Robert, I'll start us off. What, one of the things that uh, I worked with SEL programming in early learning, and one of the key factors was getting the teachers to think about their own levels of SEL or where, where their sort of understanding of their uh, sort of emotions and how they process their emotions. And that's not often an easy thing to um, address, right? So did you, what, 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 what did you see as challenges and, and how did you address those challenges in working with teachers thinking about their own uh, ability to process their emotions and, and understand how to, how to work with, with uh, their students? You know, it, it, in terms of the research and in, in the research, I didn't go into it too much other than identify that a lot of the teachers recognize that it is important for them. Um, I think the challenge for, you know, all of us as educators, especially, you know, looking at K-12, um, it looks different for everybody. And I think recognizing that what, what's going to help you is not going to be the same as somebody else. So going out and just kind of giving ideas and whatnot, I think at times that's why it comes off as another thing to do. And I think really it's a more reflective process than how do we get folks, really all of us, to spend the time to do that? Um, how do we slow down our thoughts? How do we slow down what we're doing um, to help ourselves? And to, because when we, when we do that, we're gonna be helping kids because then we're gonna be modeling the right thing for them we're going to be modeling that emotion management. We're going to, we're going to model our language and, and how we talk with, with students, even under stressful times. So I think that's why it's so complicated is because I think it is different. I think there are some good go-tos, you know, that, that people talk about. Um, but the challenge is it, it, it almost has to be done on a personal level. And I think maybe even just providing time for folks to do that and, and building awareness is 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 critical so I, I would go with awareness and and time and even bringing more and not losing sight of it so um so then people can even on a car ride home when they have a when they're thinking hey what can i do or maybe they're talking with someone at home um so yeah i think it's just awareness and and letting them really develop that on their own with with support yeah no no thank you um other questions for robert there is a question in the chat, if you want to read it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Hill. What role do you see, this is from George, what role do you see higher education institutions in the work in developing or supporting primary and secondary school SEL? And second question, do they include SEL structure, classroom management, and practice in the curriculum and pre-service teacher training? You know, I think it kind of jumping in with that second question, I think it depends on the context of a district and a school. I think some schools, yes, it's there. I think with the academic demands that are always evolving in, in districts, um, I do see how SEL, even though you know, like in my study, it was put alongside even being more important than academic growth uh, and the academic needs of kids. But I think the struggle is the academics always end up bumping SEL at times, where you can see that. So really, while the programming is there, making sure the programming is done with fidelity, um, revisiting it, um, and really taking a look at, like in this case, um, 
where, where I did my research, the SEL data is collected. What do you do with that? You know, how do you utilize that, that data to grow and even um, let SEL evolve even more? So um, I think it's there in districts and, and the, um, the importance and, and the recognition of SEL is there. It's just a matter of that fidelity and really, really uh, sticking with it year after year. So I think the other part, I forgot the other part of that question. I agree. So what role do you see higher education institutions in the work in developing or supporting primary and secondary school SEL? I think, you know, in interviewing teacher candidates when, you know, it's that time of year, the awareness of different SEL frameworks, especially like CASEL, uh, is not there. Um, and I think higher ed can do a better job at bringing that awareness to, um, to teachers, especially K-12, you know, and, and really looking because the thing people may not realize, and again, this is in my research, there's a lot of outside research connecting SEL with career readiness. So what kids are doing in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, in terms of collaborating with each other, talking with each other, um, solving problems effectively, and managing their emotions, they need all of that down the road when they graduate high school and potentially look at you know, what they're doing you know, post-secondary. Um, but that connection between career readiness and SEL is, is a real one. So how does higher ed really can help connect those pieces for teacher candidates going into the classroom to really see that? Um, and bring that in with them because it's more important that we realize. No, thank you, Robert. Thanks for the question, George. It, it brings to mind because in early learning, Castle, for example, is the air that everyone breathes. And it just reminds me of there's there's large walls between early learning K-12 and higher ed that the lessons learned in one of those those areas doesn't often translate to uh, other areas. For, you know. uh, other questions for Robert? I have a question, um, and I know that this wasn't explicitly uh, part of your research, um, but do you have a vision for what teacher SEL would look like? Like if you could implement that in your school, what would that look like for your teachers? I, you know, one, one of the participants um, mentioned how when, when the students during the school day have their quiet time, and it's called quiet time, it's 10 minutes after lunch, and the kids come into the classroom and they sit at their desk, they can draw, they can, they can basically do what they want. It's generally not on electronics like computers and things like that, but say a kid is behind on an assignment and they're gonna feel better by working on that a little bit, or say they just wanna doodle, say they wanna journal, say they wanna sit there with their head down. They can use that time any way they want. There were a couple of participants who noted that that type of structure in the school actually helped them because they use that time also. Now they do that on their own. And I think the, that's why I go back to the awareness piece that I mentioned to Craig, what Craig's question before is those teachers recognize that, hey, I need that right now. This quiet time isn't only for my kids, you know, starting their afternoon, this actually helps me get ready for my afternoon with my students. Now, you know, again, this is an elementary context where you have your class all day, you know, so you don't have different kids coming in and out. You know, you, you are with your kids all day. Um, so that awareness piece, how can some of those structures like quiet time really be helpful uh, for them? So I, that's one idea. Um, Others, I think that psychological safety that teachers need with each other, I think to be able to talk with each other and, and promoting that amongst school-based teams is so important because if they have that trust with each other, they can maybe, you know, maybe they're more free to talk. Maybe they feel more supported. Maybe they, you know, and that, that's gonna look different for all of them, but I go back to that too a little bit. But again, I think that's such a challenge because, um, you know, how can the adult side of SEL be really authentic? Because if it's not, I don't know, it, it, it's, and how to help with it, I, again, is challenging. 
Thanks for the question. Good, 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 uh, good discussion. We have one more question in the chat and then we'll close it up. This is from Tiffany. Did you run into any challenges associated with the occasional association of SEL with critical studies bans? Or uh, I imagine that extends to other kinds of issues that some people sometimes have with SEL. Yeah, not, not during the research piece. Um, I just know myself professionally outside of the research, um, there's a common misperception of what SEL is that, that is rising, um, that is coming up. And I think that's, that's the other role, you know, that where this research might be helpful is looking at how, you know, how does SEL impact and improve school climates? How does it, you know, because it's hard to argue, you know, when teachers are telling you we're seeing improved student to student interactions, we're seeing improved student to teacher interactions. It's hard to argue that. That's a really good thing. That's what you want in schools. So the misperception of SEL is, is out there. Um, I think the more and more we're bringing awareness to it as districts and, and talking about what it, what it is and what it may not, what it's not in a way, um, is important for districts to do. Um, and again, by context, it looks different. Um, you know, there's more pushback on SEL in some places than others, um, but, but it is there, so. All right, thanks for the question, Tiffany. Robert, thank you. So I'd like to thank our presenters, Monet and Robert, for our wonderful conversations today. Really interesting, exciting, sharing your passions and your interests. I would like to thank all of you for attending today and the questions that you had, and engaging in the discussion. The next colloquium event will be Friday, May 5th from 12 to 1, and I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend, and happy holidays to those who are celebrating. Thanks.